Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody back, and I see you all got your coffee cups, so you've had your break, and uh, we're ready for our next half-hour program. For those of you joining us on television, this is just an informal Bible study. We have no denominational handle, and uh, over and over I tell people I'm not under any kind of peer pressure. I'm not under any kind of pressure from sponsors, because no one sponsors us. We depend totally on the gifts of God's people. And I think I can safely say that 90% of our contributions are under $100. So we don't have any huge millionaires supporting us. And uh, we like it that way. That way we're not beholden to anyone and uh, the Lord is our only overseer. So join us as we search the scriptures. And uh, again, we do like to always thank you folks for your letters and uh, for your financial help. But most of all, we thank you for your prayers, because pray does make a difference. And so we appreciate that more than you'll ever know. Okay, we uh, finished up our last program with just sort of an introduction to the book of Revelation. And remembering now that this is a book of prophecy tied to the Old Testament prophecies. Daniel and Revelation just fit hand in glove. And uh, it's all Jewish. It is written primarily to the Jewish people in preparation for the horrors of those final seven years, which again comes out of Daniel chapter 9. But uh, that doesn't mean we don't study it. That doesn't mean it's not profitable for us. Of course it is. And I think the major profitability of it tonight is that everything you see happening in the world tonight is getting ready for this final seven years. Everything. Don't blame the politician. Don't blame any one group. It all has to come to pass, whether the Democrats do it or the Republicans do it or someone else does it or European community gets in it, it has to happen. So always remember that. I think our only responsibility as believers in this whole scenario is to do all we can to hold back the wickedness. I, I had a question in one of our seminars in Florida. What can we as Christians do to turn this thing around? You will not turn it around. We're too close to the end for that, I'm sure. But we can do what we can to hold it back. I think that's our responsibility. And so this whole book of Revelation is for the Jewish believer who was facing the horrors of it, as were those little epistles. See, that's what we emphasized when we taught Peter, James, and John, that uh, they might be ready for the fires of testing that were just out in front of them. So again, we like to go back to the timeline a moment. I put it on during the break. And now the Old Testament prophecy starts way up here. And all the promises and prophecies made to the fathers concerning even Christ's first coming, his resurrection, his death, burial, and resurrection, his ascension back to glory. Then would come in the seven years of wrath and vexation that is spoken of in the Old Testament. Christ would return and bring in the kingdom promised to Israel ever since Abraham and David. But as we showed in the last program, you see, the Lord himself knew that this program would be interrupted, and so we went back and showed how that in the Old Testament prophecies, his first advent and his ascension, of course, was as far as the time clock went, and this was all pushed out, which becomes then our second timeline. The same Old Testament promises, the crucifixion, the ascension, but instead of the wrath of the seven years, we have now had 1,900 and some years of the church age. It has to end with the rapture of the church. We have to be out of the way because I don't care how much scripture they want to use. You cannot mix the church with Israel. It is totally impossible because Israel will go back under the law. The church is still under grace. The promises made to Israel are not given to the church, and so I can see no way for the church going into even the first half, because after all, nowhere does the Old Testament or the New say that only three and a half years are tribulation. And when we uh, look at Revelation chapter 6, and uh, you go through the seal judgments, by the time you get down to chapter 6, I'll just show you what I'm talking about. When you get down past the fourth seal, 
which are all introductory events in the front three and a half years. Then you get down to verse 8 in Revelation 6, honey. Revelation 6, verse 8. And John writes, I looked and behold a pale horse. His name that sought on him was death. Hell followed with him and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and death and beasts of the earth. So by the middle of the tribulation, what percent of the world's population is already gone? One fourth, 25 percent. Well, if that isn't tribulation, I'd like to know what is. And so the whole seven years are part and parcel of the wrath and vexation of God. But the last three and a half, where the other three fourths will go, which, of course, will be far worse. But I can never buy this concept that the tribulation is only three and a half years long. Otherwise, how could they lose one-fourth of the people in the first half? So I just don't buy into that. So anyway, getting back to my timeline where we have been, the church, 1900 time of the years, is just about over. I think we're right at the very closing day of it and the rapture of the church and then maybe a little interval of time in between. We don't know. And then the Antichrist will make his appearance, usher in the seven-year peace treaty, and it will give Israel the freedom and the opportunity to rebuild and reestablish temple worship. The Antichrist will turn against them at the middle, bring in the horrors of the last three and a half years. That will end then with the second coming of Christ, not with the rapture, with the second coming, and then he will yet bring in the kingdom. Well, that's all somewhere down the road. Now come back with me, if you will, then, to Revelation. We're still going to continue as more or less a a series of introductions to the seven Jewish churches. But before we get to them, we want to cover the opening verses. All right, verse 2. Speaking of John in verse 1, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all the things that he saw. Well, goodness, let's just go back to John's gospel a moment. See what he's talking about because it's the same John that's writing and under the inspiration of the same Holy Spirit, under the headship of the same Creator God. Now look what John writes in his Gospel, chapter 1. We might as well start with verse 1. John 1, verse 1. Some of you are still turning leaves. I don't want to go any faster than what you can do because the listening audience is no faster than you are. All right, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, whenever it was, who cares? I don't care if it was a million years or 6,000 or whatever, matters not. But in the beginning was the Word, the capitalized Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. And you know, I always emphasize that words are used to what? Communicate. So this is a reference to God the Son, the communicator of the Godhead. All right, so the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, that is, by the Word. Without Him was not anything made that was made, and in Him was life, and the life was the light of men. All right, now then you come down to verse 14 where there is no doubt whatsoever who he's talking about. He's talking about Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, God the Son. And the Word was made flesh. See how plain that is? That the Word who was in the beginning, who was the maker of everything, he was made flesh, dwelt among us. And now look how John explains it. While Christ was among John and the other eleven, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All right, now we're going to cover that word begotten a little bit later now in chapter 1 in Revelation. So come back with me. Now in verse 3. 
John, by the inspiration of the Spirit, writes, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. Now I've got to stop again. To whom is all prophecy directed? The Jew. The Jew. He is the object of all prophecy. There is no distinct prophecy concerning the body of Christ. Now, we fit in the midst of prophetic utterances, but there are no prophecies concerning the body of Christ. Now, let me always go back to Genesis 15 and give what I call the first true prophecy in Scripture. And I'm not ignoring Genesis 3.15, but that was not a statement given to the nation of Israel. That's a generalized statement that Jesus is speaking to Satan as to what would happen between him and the wicked one. But here in Genesis 15, we have what I call the first true prophecy. And it is concerning Israel and what would take place in the future. That's what prophecy is all about. Now, whenever I speak of other religions of the world, this is the point I make, and I make it without apology. There is not another religious book on earth, not a one, whether it's the Oriental religions or whether it's any other religion you can name. Not a one of them can tell future events, hundreds or thousands of years out in the future, and see them fulfilled 100%. Now, you see, even some of our famous soothsavers can supposedly make prophecies, but they're only 50%. This book is 100%. All right, now look at the first true prophecy, Genesis 15, and uh, we're going to drop in at verse 13, honey. Genesis 15, verse 13. And he, God, said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed, or his offspring, shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall be afflicted over those 400 years. Did it happen? Absolutely, to the exact day. Not 399, 400. Or if you want to take the full prophecy, it was 430. See? All right, read on. Verse 14, and also that nation, Egypt, whom they shall serve, I will judge. Did it happen? Well, the plagues were God's judgment. And I'll hear God is foretelling this hundreds of years before it happened. But it happened. All right. And so that nation whom they shall serve, I will judge. Afterward, they, Abraham's offspring, the children of Israel, shall come out with great substance, did they? Well, of course they did. They spoiled the Egyptians. The Egyptians handed over all their wealth just to get them to go. So indeed it was fulfilled. All right. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Well, Abraham died then about 75 years later, more than that, 80 years later. Then verse 16, in the fourth generation, they, the offspring of Abraham, shall come here, Canaan, again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And so that's prophecy. This is God telling an event concerning Israel that's going to take place out in the future, whether it be 400 years or 2,000 years or 3,500 years. It's still a distinct prophecy. Now, when I say 3,500 years, that reminds me of a verse I wasn't going to use, but now that we're here, we'll do it. Deuteronomy chapter 30. This is prophecy. And we've seen it fulfilled in our own day. But it wasn't a prophecy concerning the church. It was a prophecy concerning the Jew. Deuteronomy 30, verse 1 and 2. And this is why the present day situation in the Middle East with Israel back in the land and back in Jerusalem is a fulfillment of this. And that's why we know the Word of God is true. Prophecy. Fulfilled. To the last jot and tittle. 
All right, verse 1 of chapter 30, Deuteronomy. And it shall come to pass. What is that? It's a promise. It's a promise. And what's the promise? A prophecy. And here's the prophecy. That all these things that are come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and thou shalt call them to mind in some future time. Thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord thy God hath driven thee. Did they get there? Sure they did. Jews ended up in every nation under heaven. I'm always referring to James Mishner. I've done it more than once in our last week or two of travel. James Mishner, who wrote the book The Source, which was a fictional book concerning a Jewish family all the way up through history to the present time. But in doing research for the book, James Mishner determined that he found Jews in every nation under heaven, and that was in about 1980s. Every nation under heaven had Jews. Well, it was prophesied, see? Prophesied. But what else was prophesied? Next verse. And they shall return unto the Lord thy God, shall obey his voice according to all that I commanded this day, thou and thy children with all thy heart. Well, they're not there yet with all their heart and mind and soul, but they're there. They've been brought back from un every nation under heaven, and they're back in the land as a result of prophecy. All right, back to Revelation. Verse 3. Back to Revelation. So blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy, the one that is about to come from the pen of the Jew, John. And it's Jewish prophecy. And keep those things which are written therein, for the time is what? At hand. So, so far as John was concerned, and I think Peter and James and Jude, this seven-year period of David's prophecy was now right out in front of them. They had no idea, as I've said a hundred times in the last six months, they had no idea of a church age. They had no idea of an Apostle Paul being commissioned to go to the Gentile. So they're on the top timeline. They're looking for the Old Testament prophecies to be fulfilled one right after the other. For the time is at hand. They had every reason to believe that these prophecies were just going to continue to be fulfilled. All right, now in light of that then, the most obvious Jews for, Jew, for John to write to would be these believing Jews who had been scattered out of the Jerusalem church because of Saul of Tarsus persecution. Saul had brought in such intense persecution that they were all scattered throughout that end of the world. All right, let me take you back to Acts chapter 8 because the only way I can establish this is with the word itself. Acts chapter 8. Eight. In the last verse of chapter 7, they have just put Stephen to death by stoning, and Saul of Tarsus was holding the clothes of those who were throwing the rocks. And now chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul, Saul of Tarsus, the one who becomes the Apostle Paul, Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. Now there again, that always takes a 15-minute study on the word ecclesia, but I've done it often enough, I'm not going to do it again today. But the word ecclesia is simply a word that means a called-out assembly. And there were various called-out assemblies in the in the biblical language. Israel, coming out of Egypt under Moses, was called the church in the wilderness in our King James or in our New Testament. That wasn't a New Testament church. 
but it was a called out assembly. God called them to himself, and they were out of Egypt, but the New Testament called it a church in the wilderness. That's not a church. Well, the same way with the church at Jerusalem. The Jerusalem church was comprised of Jews who had separated themselves from the mainstream of Judaism and were detested by their fellow Jews. And that's why old Saul, the Orthodox, is trying to stamp them out of Israel. Ethnic cleansing, they call it today, don't they? And so he's persecuting those Jewish believers unmercifully for having embraced Jesus of Nazareth as the Messiah. But it's called a church. Misleading, indeed. It was an ecclesia, a called out assembly. All right? So there was a great persecution against that called out assembly of believing Jews that Jesus was the Christ out of the mainstream of Orthodox Judaism. And because of that persecution, they were what? Scattered abroad, out of Jerusalem, see? And they went throughout the regions of Judea and up north to Samaria, except who? Except the apostles. Now this, beloved, is eight years after Pentecost. The Pentecost, the Apostles aren't out there in the Gentile world preaching the gospel. They're still in Jerusalem. And I want to hammer this home. They haven't gone out into the world to preach the gospel. They are staying in Jerusalem because they knew that if Christ should come, it would be to the Mount of Olives. It'd be Jerusalem. So they're not going to go. And there they sit. All right, now then to show you, over to 1119, still in Acts, another great verse that just blows away most of what Christendom thinks and believes. Acts 1119, plain English, so plain a kid can understand it. The theologians can't, isn't it funny? Acts 1119. And again, this is probably about eight years after Pentecost. Now they who were scattered abroad upon that persecution that arose around Stephen traveled as far as, now watch these places, they traveled as far as Phoenix, Cyprus out there in the Mediterranean, and up to Antioch in Syria, and as these Jews were scattered, they preached the word. The only word they have yet is the Old Testament. There's no New Testament yet. And so they're preaching the Old Testament to none but what? Jews only. Your Bible said it. Mine says it. But Christendom rebels at that. They think it all started back there in Matthew. No, it didn't. They're still sticking to the Jewish program. The 12 are staying in Jerusalem, and the Jews being scattered because of the persecution are still not approaching anybody but Jew only. All right, now then, once again, back to Revelation. And uh, we're going to find, I'm going to run out of time again. Wow. Okay, we got to finish verse 3. So blessed is he that readeth, because after all, this was written to Jews. And so for those Jewish believers scattered throughout that end of the world will be blessed if they can follow their road map. Now, you know, they like to talk about the road map in the Middle East today. Hey, they better take this one. <laughs> they better use this one. This is more accurate than anything the politicians can put together. All right, so blessed would be to these Jews if they could read and understand what God is laying out in front of them so that they might deal with the horrors of the pressures, the testing of fire that is facing them. All right, so blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy, this book of Revelation, and keep those things which are written therein, that is in this prophecy, for the time is at hand. And they had no reason to believe otherwise. 
Now, before we go any further or go into the next program, I'll go back and hit our timeline once again. They're on the top timeline, and so they are actually in, uh, in this time frame right in here. Here they are. Christ has already ascended back to glory. He's gone through the death, burial, and resurrection. The tribulation is right out in front of them. And so everything that's in place there is now in place here. So both times are relevant, whether it's just before the tribulation up here, before the church age came, or here we are now at the end of the church age, and once again, we'll find Jews being readied for the horrors of the seven years to come. But of course, remember that before that happens, the church has been raptured out. And this is just as relevant today as it was 1900 and some years ago. And again, all you have to do is just look at the political scenario. We're dealing with ancient Babylon in Iraq. Iran is ancient Mede-Persia. Syria is ancient Greek. The Roman Empire being revived is the European community, and it's coming up daily. In fact, I was reading again the other day, even the Jews are beginning to recognize that they're going to have to really deal with Western Europe more than they do with America, because that's where their markets are. That's where the, the wealth is coming from. And so everything is right back 1900 and some years later, as it was when these Jewish epistles were first written. And so it applies past as well future, although not that far into the future. So always remember these things, that as we read these little Jewish epistles, that they were preparing Jews for that day and time, for the coming tribulation, but it was also preparing Jews today. The Jews today should be reading this stuff and realizing of what is ahead of the nation because God will never return Christ to set up the kingdom until this is all fulfilled. And you know, the glory of it is, things in here that were never understood until our time of technology is now exploding out in front of us. You know, we always used to say when they see the two witnesses lay on the streets of Jerusalem, it'd be satellite television. But you know, Laura had a better idea the other day. It's these cell phones. These pictures sending cell phones are going to be everywhere by the time those two witnesses are laying in the streets of Jerusalem. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.